Okay, good, right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to uh, the, I've lost count, the number, um, a number of, um, in our series of interviews with New York School adjacent or affiliated or enthusiastic uh, writers and, and poets and scholars. Um, Paolo Javier is joining us today. Thank you for being here. Um, Paolo is the former Queen's Poet Laureate, um, born in the Philippines, uh, grew up all over the world, um, Manila, uh, Cairo, Westchester County, uh, Vancouver. Um, he's a sound poet, um, as well as a visual and sound artist, um, the recipient of a Robert Rauschenberg Foundation Artist Fund grant in 2021, um, a featured artist in MoMA PS1's 2015 Greater New York Exhibition and Queen's Museum's 2018 Queen's International Exhibition. Um, the author um, of four books of uh, uh, full-length poetry that some of you may have um, come across, probably have come across, um, including The Time at the End of This Writing, which received a small tra press traffic book of the year award and Court of the Dragon, um, published by Night Boat. Um, and a recent book, which I've got here, um, OBB, also by Nightbook, um, which came out, uh, I want to say last year? Yeah, November. November last, November last November. year. Yeah. Um, and and we're, we're just kind of anticipating a new book, which is coming out uh, next month. Um, so very prolific. There it is. <laughs> um, true account of talking to the seven in Sunnyside, um, yeah. and and one of the reasons among many that I've um, that I'm so delighted to have Paolo here is just because I was looking through the acknowledgments um, of this book of OBB, um, and amongst a kind of amazing list of um, influences, including William Burroughs, um, Raymond Cano, uh, Mariah Carey, George <laughs> Harriman, Sonia Arles. <laughs> Uh, Jess Collins, Claude Cahoon. Um, we've got uh, Ted Berrigan and Joe Brainard. Um, and, and Paolo and I first kind of came into contact through talking about poetry, but particularly talking about New York school poetry, um, Joe Brainard, comics, um, and, and other influences, including New York school poets like Joe Saravolo, who, who sort of are floating around, I guess, um, but perhaps don't get quite as much attention as some of the other big names. Um, so, Paolo, thank you very much for being here and for talking to us. Um, the, the first question is one that I just ask um, everyone who talks to us, and, and that's your kind of New York School origin story. What drew you to New York School writing? Uh, thank you, first of all, for having me, Rona. It's a, a real honor and a privilege to be in conversation with you and to be in conversation with these poets who you have been championing and, and, and studying. And uh, thank you for your scholarship and for every, all the stuff that you've been doing uh, with Oliver and bringing New York School poets to your end. <laughs> um, I would say, uh, I would say in terms of chronology, um, I first encountered the New York School when I was an undergraduate. And it was time, this was in the 90s, I'm totally dating myself. It was really timed with my returning to New York City. I spent some formative years here. First time I moved outside of the Philippines. My family moved to New York. Uh, we lived in Katona, Westchester, but I had two aunts who lived in Queens. And so my experience of New York City was immediate. Like we would come down here every weekend when I first uh, visited the U.S. It was in New York City. So I started coming back to New York City as an undergraduate trying to flee Vancouver, British Columbia. I just uh, was miserable there for several reasons that I don't need to get into. Um, and it's also timed with my discovery of Frank O'Hara. And I discovered Frank O'Hara through Brad Gooch's City Poet. Um, and uh, Donald Allen's collected poems. And um, Frank O'Hara was not taught at the University of British Columbia. He's one of those poets look, for a lot of us who we, f we gravitate to, right? He's mm. in the universe, he's in the universe, right? Um, force is in mobility, as, they, as he would write. And, um, you know, I mobilized towards me, mobilized towards me. And I read, I picked up a copy of Brad Gooch's um, City Poet at Little Sisters, which is the uh, amazing queer bookstore 
on Denman Street at the time. I think it's still there, Davy in Vancouver. And it changed everything for me. Um, I was fumbling through a pretty traditional education in poetry and literature, which I was resisting mm. and finding ways to break out of. And I also had encountered the great modernist scholar, Peter Quartermain, his class on American poetry, um, which is an undergraduate course that so many poets in Vancouver were changed by, like Lisa Robertson, uh, Jeff, I think Jeff Dirksen, all these poets who come out of Vancouver encounter Peter's class and they're changed and it changes. The, um, so I consider myself one of those poets. And I encountered Frank O'Hara, a city poet. And that really emboldened me to just explore more of his um, trajectory, his lineage. Mm. And um, I then found this book for $20 at the time at um, uh, McLeod's, which is his famous secondhand bookstore um, on Hastings Street, in Vancouver. And I just became obsessed. I just became, I couldn't sleep. I was so hungry to learn everything and read everything. And I just started connecting the constellations. And uh, from O'Hara, I, you know, then discovered that first generation, Ashbery, Squaler, and, uh, uh, you know, I guess um, all the other poets, De Prima, Leroy Jones, mm. uh, Baraka. Um, and then the second generation, uh, I would, I'm, I'm skipping here, but Ted Berrigan, I still remember it distinctly. It was right before I was attending the screening of Maya Darren. And um, I had picked up a copy of his Penguin Selected Poems edited by Alice Notley. It was a great cover. And I opened up to Winter Crisp and the Brittle Mist of Snow as like make me, you know. And it was like, you know, that scene in 2001 where space-time continuum right? is coming yeah, at you. Yeah, yeah. And I just knew that I had to move. And um, I don't even remember, you know, the screening. I just remember rereading that poem. And then, and then that was it. Like, I just became totally obsessed with Ted Berrigan. And a couple of years later, I found myself in New York. Um, I would, will also say that there's a personal connection. Uh, I grew up with Anselm Berrigan's cousin, Will Yakulik, the artist Will Yakulik. When I had first moved to um, Westchester and I, att I was attending middle school there, I, Will was one of my first friends. Wow. And, um, it's like a wonderful, wonderful coincidence. So in, in many ways, like the New York school is a sort of personal, a sort of part of my life, right? Yeah. Uh, and so yeah. Will Yakulik is on, I think, Alice's side of the family. And he's a terrific artist in his own right. Um, and I ran into Will at a reading years ago. He found me. We made eye contact. And then, hey, I remember you. <laughs> it's just it's just really wild. Um, and so the, it was O'Hara, uh, Ted Berrigan, and then Ted Berrigan, and then Joe Brainerd. Seapress. Um, mm. Seapress became uh, such a obsession of mine and just their collaborations and their interest in comics. And then my next obsession became Bernadette Mayer and Joe Brainerd. And um, mm. when I moved to New York, my first fall in New York, I apprenticed a, a workshop taught by the late and great Frank Lima. And Frank Lima yeah. became a, a big, big mentor of mine. And Frank Lima then introduced me to the New York School of Poets who are not so recognized, but are no, nonetheless um, important. And I think for me as a, as a poet of color, immediate to me, like Frank Lima growing up um, uh, Bariquan in what we call Spanish Harlem mm. um, and his trajectory is so different. I think he studied with Kenneth Koch. He's a recovering addict um, and uh, he became a chef. And he was teaching at the New York Restaurant School, and he was also a boxer. And I just, I, he took me under his wing, and I just felt so connected to him. He was living in Queens at the time. He was very much in love with his, uh, I think, second wife, Helen, who's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And then from Frank Lima, I got to know Joe Chiravolo's work, and I guess all the other poets who 
you know, are not as visible in that anthology, mm. New York School yeah. of Poets, you know. Um, and yeah, just really then expanding my own personal map, all the references and Ted's uh, sonnets, right? Um, but also feeling welcome, you know, uh, I, I felt because of Frank, I got introduced to, you know, the downtown art world that was New York school adjacent. Uh, I knew John Yao. Mm. Uh, I'd met John Yao before, but John Yao was good friends with uh, Frank Lima. Uh, and so all these other then poets who I would meet who are orbiting around the New York school. Um, and then I got to know John Ashbery through um, the T. Bordenage Gallery, Eric Brown, who was then in charge yeah. of the gallery. We became friends, and uh, he was always telling John uh, about what I was up to. And John and I actually read together at DIA um, in 2013, which was wow. so, so momentous and awkward for me just because um, – what an influence. Yeah. You know, what what an yeah. influence. I'm a big O'Hara fan, and you can probably see O'Hara's influence in my work. Mm. But Tennis Court Oath and John Ashbery's Living Between the Languages and his outsider English really courses through, you know, more courses more through my work. I find. Um, and so I, Yeah, I can see more of John Ashbery. Tennis court tennis court oath, John Ashbery. Yeah, yeah. Um, in some yeah. of your work, for sure, that, yeah. that idea of yeah, kind of living between languages. Yeah, for sure. yeah, yeah. Totally and looking just... at looking at text as well as reading text. Hundred percent, and you know Bernadette Mayer's sonnet mm. and her ex and her experiments. I would say, say sometime in ninety seven, I encountered it in a very rudimentary version of the internet, but um, the Buffalo <laughs> EPC page. Yeah. Both Bernadette Mayer and Charles Bernstein, who Charles is a friend. I know he's a language poet, mm. but I actually find that he's more aligned with the New York School in many ways and um, yeah. his experiments. But Bernadette Mayer, I just also fell down that rabbit hole of just reading everything that Bernadette Mayer's um, published. Yeah, and, and the permission that she's she's given me as zero to nine and. The Akanchi and all of um, the smaller publications. So that's a lot. So, I mean, that, that's how I fell into the New York school. And in many ways, I felt I feel indebted to their work and I feel like I was saved by their work. Yeah. It was a really difficult time in my life. And I was really trying to figure myself out in many ways, identity. Um, and I felt, you know, the New York school it was so inclusive of different identities. And um, I just, I felt like I could write. I felt like yeah. I could make poetry because of their work. Yeah. So, yeah. Good. I don't know. No, that, I mean, that's, it's a, it's a really fascinating history um, that, that kind of combines the personal connection with that, that I love the idea of the kind of biographical discovery of O'Hara yeah. with, that kind of extensive and kind of experimental, like, what would, what would the word be? It's just the, the kind of connective way in which you seem to have moved through. Yeah. 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 In, yeah. in which they, like you started by saying that, like talking about being in conversation with poets, and it really sounds like that's something that happened, that, that Bernadette Mayer might feel like she's in conversation with Joe Brainerd, and Brainerd might feel like he's in conversation with Frank Lima, and you can kind of put yeah. them into connection, even where you know actual connections may not have existed or been that strong. I, I, I'm interested in that idea that there's a constellation of writers who are kind of moving around, changing each other and, and shaping each other. And I'd include you in that kind of thinking about the the idea of that space time continuum um, in the context of poetry. I think sounds really generative. Yeah, I mean the sonnets remains really foundational for me mm. and speaking of space-time continuum how it that broken up you know yeah. That, yeah, yeah. that 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 broken up sense of time there but also breaking it open for so many readers to yeah you know be in the same space and time as Shakespeare and all yeah. of Ted's influences and also yeah. the future right yeah um so 
Uh, I mean, Joe Chiravolo, for obvious reasons, I mean, he was born in Astoria, but maybe that's not so obvious, but there's a Queens connection. But also, yeah, I really felt I'm not, I wasn't the most um, engaged member of the St. Mark's community when I moved, mainly because I was an outsider. Mm. And I wanted to be seen as a poet and not be sort of social. So I was yeah. sort of approach, approach avoidance, but Anselm was so warm, so generous. The folks at the project were very supportive of me, um, but I've always sort of maintained that distance just because I'm in that way, I guess, shy. Um, yeah. And that's why I love Joe Travolo's very interior work, um, yeah. Fits of Dawn and et cetera, uh, yeah. his Hellgate poems. Um, so uh, yeah, so um, I think, Part of it too is how do I situate myself who's from the Philippines, yeah. you know, and lived in all these different yeah. cities. And I know a lot of these New York school poets are not from here with the exception of Bernadette Mayer and a few others. She grew up in Brooklyn. Mm. Um, so I'm in that sense, I'm glad that I didn't encounter a canon because then I was free to discover and make the connections myself. Yeah. Um, but O'Hara really is the one. And uh, it, Brad Gooch, who I've gushed to over and over, um, I did an event at the Highline, and Brad was one of the readers, and I yeah. thanked him. For it. And uh, that book, City Poet, which a lot of New York school poets are not crazy about, but for me, that was a portal for me. That gave me you know, my, that helped me make my decision that and Ted Berrigan's selected poems to move back to New York. Yeah. And be a part of, um, be a part of the poetry that they were blazing for all of us. So, yeah. Yeah. For you, does it feel, maybe this is an obvious question, but very kind of rooted in the writing itself. Does that feel more important than say St. Mark's or, the kind of personalities and I'm thinking about this just just because of um mentioning Frank Lima yeah. the, the questions and the conversations that um have sort of been had but maybe need to be had more about the the whiteness of the New York school yeah um the at least initially the the wealth of the New York yeah. school there are there are kind of the three of them yeah in, yeah Trinity. there are ways in which Barbara you can see yeah, you, you can see a kind of exclusionary, you know, aura to yeah. some of it. If you if you were to look at it, at least on paper and say, well, what does this actually look like for a reader or a writer who, who say it doesn't look like Frank O'Hara um, yeah. or doesn't sound like John Ashbury? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I wondered, is, does the writing kind of mitigate that or help navigate that, that sense of kind of privilege for some and not for others? I mean, I think for me, I uh, uh, the, you always want to connect some out of their biography. I think, um, I mean, yeah. Frank O'Hara, Frank O'Hara, this is in my book, Court of the Dragon, like one of the first, on the first page, Frank O'Hara stationed in Manila. Yeah. I mean, he was yeah. in the Philippines and he yeah. writes about that, right? In, in memory of my feelings, I think. Mm. Yeah. Um, but I think um, for me, I latched onto their experience with language, their queerness, yeah. certainly. Yeah. Um, which was definitely a space that was vital to my um, consideration of language, right? And how do I be in and out and just the slipperiness of that. Mm. But also, you know, Skyler, his mental mm. health, his mental health, like he was really writing to that. Yeah. And and his sense of abjectness with the body. Uh, yeah. And um, John Ashbery being abroad, uh, and yeah. Franco Frank O'Hara just his his wonder. That's something that I could really connect to yeah. the the cattiness, yeah. the gossip. I I'm like that. Like I I value friendship so much. Yeah. And I wanted to find a way to have that be inhabiting in my poetry. Um, mm. I was mindful of how white. St. Mark's was, and I think just to be perfectly frank, pun intended, um, that's what I think kept me from feeling completely welcome in St. Yeah. Mark's. Uh, but, you know, the flip side of that was as someone who liked experimental poetry, I felt excluded from 
you know, the Asian American writing community, right? You know, uh, which is which tends to be more conservative in terms of their notion of writing serving yeah. the purpose of articulating identity, which I think still prevails today in terms of official verse culture. Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't feel socially. I may have found friendships there, but I knew it ultimately wasn't going to last very long because for me, poetry, it was the writing that matters. Yeah. And in the long term, St. Mark's, I feel, has always seen me as a poet and has welcomed my poetry, you know, to the community, which is really what it's about for me. It's not yeah. friendships. I'm not on social media. I find all that quite terrifying. Um, <laughs> you know, it's hard enough, you know, being a poet living in your own skin, I can't imagine what it's like to suddenly let let that be your personal world, like live with poets and, <laughs> you know, live and write and breathe with poets. Oh, gosh, please. No, that was not a requirement for me to feel like I'm engaged. Um, mm. So I'm always indebted, I'll always be indebted to, you know, the New York School of Poets community, St. Mark's, for seeing me as a poet. Yeah, uh, and I don't take that for granted because I, to this day, I still don't feel seen by my own quote unquote community. Yeah, you know. Yeah, um, and that has to do with, you know, the bias against experimental literature, right? So that's that's what I felt. John Ashbery and Frank O'Hare and Skyler and Barbara Guest and all of them were really challenging, and yeah. that that what you call exclusionary i feel like they were writing for themselves yeah you know yeah, i agree and i well, gertrude stein i write for myself and strangers and so yeah you know i make no apologies about for for embracing them uh, i knew how white they were but there were other entry points for me that mm. we should not overlook their queerness yeah. that's a safety right there right yeah they're outsider status in terms of language i know they yeah. came from harvard they moved through harvard but the mental health yeah right and they loved the visual arts right like yeah. they were so inspired by the materiality and the practice of painters who were not being seen mm. so um, i they remember were john ashbury saying that he loved the painters because they taught him that he could be he was free to be free yeah and, and, and that that that's what I took from the New York yeah, school. Yeah. That's what I still take from from their work is that sense of freedom. And yeah. Then it became more immediate for me given my obsessions with comics and pop culture when yeah. I encountered Joe's work. Right. Um, so and his collaboration. I love collaboration, as you mm. know. Uh yeah. that's that's so important to me. And the um the journey is so vital to me. Not so much the destination, which sounds so cliched, but I love that. I love just the unfinishedness of mm. right. Yeah, the making, <laughs> the making yeah. of things, the making. Yeah, of things. yeah, yeah, yeah. So on that, so let's um let's talk for a little bit about this book, um, okay. because um it's something that that speaks, I think, very well to what you've been saying in terms of comics of course collaborations um looking at this you know this is obviously by you but there's artists yeah. um two sort of three artists in yeah the, they're clear on how the how the third yeah. artist was involved. yeah so this cover this brilliant cover art yeah and even the oh, lettering okay. is by okay. is by francis estrada who yeah. um was the very first artist i attempted this work with way back way back and i think i include a page from that the one thing that we actually got put together in the acknowledgments right that's my yeah. my homage to francis and I so see. it was actually really beautiful that francis could provide this work and he's a terrific artist in his own right yeah this yeah one. i see and he did the lettering yeah. as well he did the lettering okay um, and so, then starting so uh, this on, lettering as well that's that's yeah. francis okay. yeah okay. that's francis yeah so this that's one is th this one is me and alex tarampi did some digital renderings but this mm -hmm. is me onward so alex tarampi was the the artist who i completed the book with but the main artist who I was working with is Ernest Concepcion, who's 
I mean, what kind of a name is that? Ernest Conception. Yeah. Ernest Conception. Right? Like, yeah, you can't make that up. Amazing. Uh, and he's based in Manila now. Um, okay. And when that collaboration ended, I picked up where I left off with Alex Tarampian. Okay. He did and, the d- digital stuff. Yeah. And so Alex, Alex is is now in the Philippines, but was in. No, no, no. Uh, Alex, Alex is still here. He lives Alex in. Is here. Uh, Ernest. He, Ernest is in the Philippines he's and he's doing very he's doing very well in Manila. Okay. He was in Brooklyn, had yeah. a bunch of shows here, and I guess he felt I'm not gonna speak for him, he felt like he had more opportunities, he could afford to hmm. make art full time. Yeah. Um, and he's you know doing his own thing over there. Uh, yeah. Alex, Alex is um he was my neighbor in Sunnyside, yeah. uh, and he now lives in Jersey with okay. his family okay. so but he's still in the tri-state area i saw him actually on sunday at new york comic-con we yeah spent, okay. we spent we spent the sunday <laughs> together so yeah yeah so this is a real like this is a real collaboration um, yes yes yeah. yes yeah yeah in, it's a it, i could not have completed this without um their hand yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so and and obviously there's there's it's it's kind of full of visual um, yeah. elements, which which vary hugely. Like I can just hold them yeah. up. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, there's yeah. those, there's these wonderful um, kind of yeah old movie type. Yeah, the silent film. Yeah, silent film stuff towards the end, and then we've yeah. got you know just thinking about you know the typography as well. Yeah, that, you know that's perhaps harder to see, but right. Um, so it feels very visual and it feels very much like an object. Good, well thank you. A book. It, it feels really special in that sense. It kind of feels oh, like it exceeds the terms of, you know, a, the average book that I might have oh. on my shelf because of that. Right. Um, thank you. Yeah. You know, that credit goes to Nightboat, to uh, Rissa Hockenberger there, mm. their design, but also Nightboat's um, capaciousness with really... Um, allowing us to come up with a book that we've come up with. I think, yeah. you know, the, the Bigfoot image that you, you showed uh, that's in color and yeah. our, my work with Ernest reached its limit when we met in his studio in Gowanus and generated a series of these poster size yeah. collaborations. And that was initially, that was my goal was how do we just lose the distinctions? How do you, we just get rid of the boundaries between writer and artist? Yeah. Um, and have that just be one identity. And and so that, some examples of that make it into the work. Um, and thank you to Nightboat for accommodating the adjustments yeah. that needed to happen. Um, yeah. Stephen Motika, um, Lindsay Bolt, and everyone at Nightboat were wonderful. Uh, in terms of helping me realize the book that it needed to be, not what yeah. I wanted it to be, because I didn't know. Uh, I knew it would take a while to work with a designer. Yeah. That's the last collaboration. Yeah. So I wanted to give a uh, much love and a shout out to Rissa Risa and uh, Nightboat for that part, that collaboration. Yeah. yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's a, a really exciting thing to see because I think, the, often the difficulty with this kind of thinking or these sorts of ideas in terms of the relationship between illustrations and words is is how do we actually make that um and and often it seems that you know that it, it can be a kind of prohibitive idea just yeah. the very idea of doing it is sort of like can you could you not just write you know like a regular poet please <laughs> <laughs> and you know credit to Stephen Motika who yeah. you know I don't want to speak for him, but he didn't even know, I think, what it would look like. And I I was happy to hear that because neither did I. Yeah. I didn't know what the dimensions would be. They made the decision for the size of the book. And I just trusted them on that. They're trusting me to take this project on. And they trusted me to, you know, really provide a context for their publicity team yeah um yeah but it was a conversation that we were having and then it became this collaboration you know um here's the book and it requires as you know like 
a lot of trusting. And for yeah. a Virgo, for a Virgo, that's not easy. <laughs> uh, so I was channeling, I was really channeling Joe, Joe and Ted there, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and and so, it feels like it both in terms of that, the publishing process and the kind of writing and collaborating process, because yeah. there's, there's you and Alex and Ernest, and then there's yeah. publishers, and, and it yeah. does seem to be a kind of, yeah. rather than, you know, you do your bit, and then you hand it over and they do their bit, it does seem to feel really kind of organic. And for me, at least as a reader, that, or a, even a viewer, it kind of unfolds in that way, in the sense that you just yeah. you don't really know where it's going. And every turn of the page, there's something new and yeah. surprising. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really unusual. I wondered for you, what's the kind of relationship between the images and the text? If that's um, a facile question. Yeah, no, 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 that's really important. I spent these past two decades really um, figuring that out. And uh, this is really just a fraction of the work that I generated. Uh, and, mm -hmm. um, and that's me being a Virgo, but I think it's also the work itself. And uh, I would say the, the, the relationship can be immediate, yeah. can be not quite literal, but there is a, a connection. Contextually, there's a connection uh, emotionally, um, but there's also a connection, I would say, materially, and maybe that's my, my own knowledge in terms of mm -hmm. the chance procedures that were generated. I worked a yeah. lot with um, the university copy machine <laughs> that <laughs> I had access to, and I really used the Xerox machine as uh, an instrument for yeah. thinking of new ways to see pages. Uh, what would the discoloration, what would the exposure look like? What meaning would that generate to the image and the text? And then a combination of, okay, I think this has to be with this because I have this idea of this language with this image and there's an mm. immediate corollary in terms of incident, in terms of when I was collaborating with Ernest, but then also, what about this possibility? What meaning does it open up? Um, uh, so it's sort of like a cop-out, but I think the relationship between text and image is foregrounded in the work. Yeah. But there is a narrative there. I think there is an emotional through line in the book. Um, and this is not information that readers need to know, but it's a, it's a sequel to a poem that appears in my first book, the time at the end of this writing. And that poem yeah. is called Mi Ultimo Adios Ion Kai Original Brown Boy. And, wow. um, and uh, when I published that book, which is wears its New York school love on its sleeve and my love of mm. indie rock, mm. <laughs> um, that poem stood out for me because it was so unique from all the poems that I had published, written before and since. Yeah. It had, it was... O'Hara-ish, it had a voice, it had a projected personality. And so I always wondered, well, this deserves its own book. So mm. OBB is sort of a sequel yeah. to that poem. Okay. It, it, it's in the tradition of the last poem, Ted, Bo Ted Bergen's last right. poem, which yeah, I absolutely yeah. love. You yeah. know? Um, and uh, yeah. all the last poems that are out there, you know, mm. so... I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, no, that's really, that's, that's <laughs> yeah. kind of one, I mean, the, the kind of the idea of the emotional connection and the, and the narrative through line that is a kind of emotional connection, I think certainly comes through. Um, yeah. And I wondered if, if that has something to do with, there's a, it feels full of characters or at mm. least full of voices. Yeah. Um, and, and partly because of the way that it reads, yeah. It does almost feel like a kind of epic. There is a story yeah. there that you can't you can't you can't quite say, you know, this happens, then this happens, then this happens. It's not that kind of epic, but it does have a kind of epic quality to it in mm -hmm. terms of a sort of emotional narrative. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, it's hard mm -hmm. to pin down, I think, a little bit like Joe Brainard's work. Once you start yeah. <laughs> getting really yeah. close to it, it slips away. Yeah. Um, yeah. So maybe, I mean, it, it reminded me of some of Bernadette Mayer's work as well. Um, of a text like memory in yeah. which again if you kind of look very closely it sort of blurs a little but if you zoom out a, a bit and kind of think about it as yeah. an object there is an emotional through line there yeah um 
that that is that is charactered and voiced um, yeah yeah so i would say it definitely is um I would say epic, maybe not in the martial sense, but yeah, um, yeah. epic in the uh, maybe interior, an epic, a conflict, mm. like the conflagration of materiality and materials. Um, but it's epic, certainly in the scope. Uh, it's really drawing, pun intended, from so many different approaches, right? To yeah. text and image. And cinema, I think, is yeah. there's a reason why that last chapter, I think, is at the end is because it's in cinema where that epicness can be inhabited yeah. and the viewer be a part of it, right? And not feel like, oh, I, I'm not getting it, all that subtext. And uh, well, of course, this is a book, this is not cinema, but I would think the layering of that, the, the disconnectiveness, the disjunction uh, as a potential space. Yeah. That's what I was channeling. Certainly in the sequence, uh, Remain as Beast, those sonnets, they look traditionally like sonnets, but I'm channeling Mayer, Burroughs, mm -hmm. Berrigan. Mm -hmm. And I was really thinking of those lines as film strips, mm. you know, experimental film. Right? Yeah. Rudy Burkhart's photographs. Yeah. Right. How disembodied they are, but also like it's a universe in that coffee cup that he's taking a picture yeah. of. Yeah. On a windowsill. So... Yeah, so you're right, like the lensing in and out, mm. and it's a, a poetry of poetics to be experienced in other forms that allows you to experience the poetry. So Yeah, yeah, because I like I really liked um, the idea that you can look through these kind of filmic sequence, this filmic yeah. sequence and see what you see. Yeah. And notice. Um, mm -hmm. I noticed who I think is Don Draper. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah, right, and Danny right, Darko right, as well. Right, right. Like, Right. There are these right. kind of personal moments of connection yeah. and it strikes me just going back to what you were saying earlier about this kind of freedom to discover and make yeah. connections seems seems quite present. I, I think often when um, when we talk about the relationship between text and image, it can feel quite like combative, like there's yeah. it's often framed in the language of tension between text and image. So like art by someone like Ed Ruscha, um, or even yeah. like Lee Krasner, you're like there's a tension between the writing and the and the image. But what seems yeah. to happen here is it feels more like a working together, um, a kind of collaboration or like a a process of connection between yeah. what we're reading and also what mm. we're seeing, and that's kind of happening at the same time. Um, yeah, I guess that's the challenge that all poets and artists face. Like, how can yeah. your work? How can your work be? be right all of those things be formal and be a sub have a subject and mm. the form be that subject and um it's it's steeped in comics and that experience of reading comics it's totally freeing because no it's not telling you where to start and yeah. uh where to end when you read a comics page and i think brainerd really paved the way bp nickel did that too uh i would say i was influenced too by black skin white masks france fanon and yeah i would yeah. say politically aesthetically i was formulating my in this work as ambitious as this sounds and whatever failings there are entirely my own I, I was really trying to formulate a black skin white masks from my vantage point as someone philippine x and yeah. um really looking at endogamy right um mm -hmm. and sort of uh, ambiently how that connects to just the trauma of the Philippine American War, which my family has a direct experience with, not immediately, but my great grandfather was a soldier for the American army. And he fought and killed Filipinos, yeah. you know, in yeah. 1899 through 1903. And he stayed in the Philippines and had my grandmother out of wedlock. You know, she was a quote unquote bastard child. And mm. um, he lived like a king. And so, you know, I was thinking about whiteness and Philippine X identity vis-a-vis -vis 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 whiteness and shame. But then the legibility of that was something I also was thinking about. Well, I mean, I'm not trying to write an essay. Yeah. You know, uh, so I was drawing a lot from the political cartoons that I was studying at the time. Mm. 
But then also thinking of George Harriman, how he sublimates his identity. There's a reason why anthropomorphism is such a major feature of yeah. OBB. Suddenly there's a squid, there's an octopus. Yeah. Yeah. But I was also thinking about the Precambrian direction that humans could have taken, you know? Yeah. <laughs> We've, uh, and I just love octopi. I don't eat octopi. I'm a seafood lover, but... Um, and then there's the tradition of the symbolism of the octopus and surrealism. Mm. <laughs> uh Japanese porn you know <laughs> um, <laughs> so all those things but then how do you make all those things work in one work so then you turn to Lucretius and they're all their own atoms and you know yeah. <laughs> you just you really just create a space for them um, yeah yeah that seems to be kind of what has happened that it does yeah there seem to be these sort of um elements that move around each other yeah. and, and that connect each other and kind of become entangled with each other or enmeshed with each other and then yeah but then have the, the space to kind of be their own thing yeah wow yeah um, yeah but it seems i think you talked in the in the um the piece um the essay that that ends the book about the idea of uh, the unheard rhythm um and and i and, and that seems to be kind of along the lines of what you're talking about that there is yeah there is rhythm is often something felt rather than heard and i and i really right. like the idea that you can be feeling something and not hearing it or yeah. you know, feeling something but yeah i'm not feeling it and, I, and those elements in terms yeah. of trauma and, and migration and um the love of o the octopus like that can all work yeah. together in a really um in a way that doesn't feel didactic. And I guess that, that's where Fanon's a really striking influence. Yeah. Um, that idea that he wants to move to a world where, not, not where colonialism has ended, but where the idea of colonialism just isn't entertained anymore. Yeah, yeah. Not, not to say that I'm in the same realm as Fanon who put his body on the line, right? Like, no, yeah. no, no, no way, you know, but he is a huge influence on, on, my thinking also his internationalist yeah. perspective yeah. and him coming out of negritude, surrealism through Césaire. Uh, um, and, um, but I, what, I, what I wanted to say was the rhythm of reading a book was something that I was thinking about, but mm -hmm. also you're, you're really right to talk about an emotional practice that's so whatever when you hear about it. But when I had a, residency at the Malay colony. It was the time, yeah. a time when I was, I got to be by myself in my work. I brought with me these discarded manga, Japanese comics that I found in the basement of our building, our old building in Sunnyside. And I took it with me and I just did, you know, sort of chance procedures and just cut ups. And yeah. um, I discovered, it was revealed to me, you know, these images of these octopi, which you see in, you know, um, one of the chapters, uh, I forget what it is, Glass Gasp, which is a nod to that press too. Yeah. Glass Gasp. Yeah. Uh, and I was just cutting things up and just doing placing of text on a blank page on an emo using my emotional intelligence, whatever that mm, means. Mm. Um, but what really it was is just in being in the space, inhabiting the space that I was experiencing, thinking about this work for several years and just letting the act of tape cutting up yeah take over take over you know uh that sense of improvisation right that what's it called what does Siska Mahai say flow flow yeah yeah <laughs> Mihai Siska Mahai, yeah yeah flow um and but it's emotion it's emotional it was fraught it was scary I was by myself I didn't want to be alone uh but I had to do work and I was in a painter's studio so I was channeling that I had a painter's drafting table and um I was making a lot of decisions using non-poetic, you know, you know, strategies. Yeah. Right? Really. Yeah. 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 So visual art strategy, but chan emotionally channeling without articulating and being legible. My readings of Fanon and other post-colonial, you know, writers mm. I mm. was thinking about. Yeah. So. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, it does. It does. I was thinking a lot yeah. of I was reading this about improvisation and, and kind of how that can make sense to the person improvising. 
um, yeah. but how for the for the rest of us reading it, it, it becomes a, a process of kind of um, almost like alternate mapping. You know, yeah. we can get a we can get a glimpse inside your head, but it's yeah. just it's only ever going to be a glimpse. Um, and yeah. and then when we start laying my head on top of it, and <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it becomes it becomes very interesting. And and certainly for me, reading this this book, that there seem to be you know questions of kind of ethno national identity and migration, yeah. but also love um, and survival and talking yeah. and and yeah. food. Um, I know food, food a, right? Yeah, a big, a big thing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, food, and language, and fish kisses, yeah. yeah, yeah, and it just it seems you know all of that seems to be in there um, in one way or another. Yeah, and I, I mean, I have to say, like, I'm just grateful. I learned a lot making this book because mm. when I started it, I didn't really have any goal. I didn't really yeah. set, you know, like for most writers, I'd say, oh, I'm going to finish this. Um, I didn't have that sort of index. I was just, I just wanted to make something and just. Mm be free of official verse culture which yeah. I found myself surrounded by you know and just the goal at the time that I started this for my peers certainly my you know Asian American peers um they were they had certain ambitions and I wasn't interested in that and I just wanted to make for the sake of making and um so it just happened that this is a work beginning to end moves from analog to digital so yeah, it, yeah. but it's yeah. still a book right in many yeah. ways it has that historicity and the act of reading is foregrounded so I'm happy I learned a lot uh I'm not to say that not to say that I planned this all out the opposite yeah um but that's like the New York school like I mean I yeah. learned that trusting from New York school jazz musicians right yeah um, hip-hop the collage the fragmentation yeah dance music so the dj so yeah 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 and and it's great to see and i think really um productive to see the new york school kind of framed in that way um, yeah i think the the yasmin and i have had a lot of conversations about this and and yasmin has interviewed lots of um uh, new york school poets and the the kind of issue with the term school implies that it's sort yeah. of bounded or fixed in some way and that you can either be in it or not in it and that was why right. I was so struck by your acknowledgements but also by what you've just been saying and you know looking at an, a list of acknowledgements that can combine um you know Ernie Chan, Mariah Carey, Samuel Delaney and Joe Brainard and to kind of read Joe Brainard as he as he is you know in the world as you said about yeah. Sahara, but beyond the kind of the idea of a confined school or movement which I don't think really it was ever that confined but kind of no. it becomes this yeah this thing that's like a it's thing. a thing yeah yeah when can I can I speak can I speak to that word school yeah mm. please do I'm actually a school teacher that's my day job yeah. and uh my, my I come from a family of public school educators in the Philippines you know my grandmother started a public school in one of the hardest hit regions of the northern part of the country one of the poorest regions yeah and my 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 aunt, my mom's sister, was a public school English teacher. Mm -hmm. And I have a, a grand aunt who taught in South Central for 35 years, ESL, wow. with her thick Filipina accent, <laughs> teaching English, right? So I actually embrace that term school. I don't yeah. think of it as exclusionary. And one of the reasons why I'm so drawn to the mm. New York school is beginner's mind is so foundational through... Right a lot of their work and that's why I delight I think delight is something that I want to foreground I delight every time I read their work in Joe Brainerd and Ted Berrigan's collaborations and their own individual work when I read lunch poems mm. I'm happy and that's okay right that's a qualification for liking poetry it yeah. makes you happy and yeah. Um, yeah. that child's view and so school for me is yeah. you're learning something yeah. I, and there's irony there too right like that but it's not cynical. Yeah. And uh, I can be ironic, like every Alanis Morissette fan, but, um, you know, <laughs> I'm not, I try not to be cynical because then I'll yeah. stop making work. And I yeah, think yeah. that joy of learning, that joy of also being self-taught, like Ted Berrigan's working mm. class, right? Mm. He's working mm. class. Um, and uh, they didn't have an in 
mm. right into the art world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I, I would offer to folks who dismiss the New York school, even that term school coming from my perspective, I'm coming from a small, tiny, you know, space in the Philippines in Manila. Yeah. And I can connect to the New York school. Yeah. I have, there are multiple entry points, you know, uh, and that's how I see it. I'm not choosing to see it that way. I think mm. for me, it's, it's there. Yeah. And um, uh, I think just to call them out for their whiteness is just disingenuous to mm. the power that mm. the individual and the community has been able to, you know, project onto the world, right? Mm. Like they, they couldn't have determined the meaning that their work would generate right in 2022. Look, you're yeah. in, you're across the pond. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so um, I'm teaching, I'm teaching lunch poems tomorrow. You're teaching lunch so, poems, hopefully yeah, uh, after yeah. lunch, you know. Yeah, <laughs> just before lunch, but that's okay. We can all then repair to lunch and talk more. You can go, <laughs> yeah, you, you can go for a chocolate malt, you know, <laughs> exactly. uh, <laughs> after or have a burger, right? Yeah, I was just yeah. walking along Fifth Avenue last week and I, you know, walking by Seagram's building and, you know, yeah. Dorf Goodman and, um, yeah, I actually went to all those places when I started coming back after reading city city poet i just did pilgrimages to every single concrete location in yeah o'hara's um lunch poems yeah so yeah you know. me too me too Whenever <laughs> I'm, there, I'm like where should we go and actually yeah. one one year i had a student who produced a set of maps of the yeah. city and with a little frank o'hara on it doing his lunch lunch hour yeah. walking yeah or, yeah or yeah, kind of visiting these buildings and taking yeah. shape. Um, yeah. But I love that idea of school as being not yeah. not a kind of um, like academic term, but something that a, that is a thing where a place where you go and meet people and make yeah. friends and learn and have experiences and kind of engage in a process um, that that is often delightful, that can be really difficult, um, but that's yeah. really just about, about learning and doing and yeah. making as well, to go what, back to what you were saying about this book, like it's a school is so often about making yeah. things in a way that, you know, life often prevents us from doing once we've left. Yeah. Um, collage, for instance, is something that I think most of us will have done at yeah. school. Right. Um, you know, it's something that it's it's just it's yeah, so much a part of that kind of like childlike view, um, which is about possibility and yeah, the possibility of being delighted by really and, simple. And I have to say, you know, my entry to collage also comes out of my love of of hip hop and mm. DJ culture mm. and uh, putting disparate things together. Um, but you know, not to give you know these idols of mine a pass. I mean, there are problems there too, right? Like, mm. I mean, O'Hara's fetish for black men, mm. right? Um, <laughs> that's in his poetry. Uh, yeah. you know, uh, there's some Orientalism there too. Mm. Uh, mm. I'm not giving all of them a pass, but you know, overall, I, I, I'm an outsider. I still yeah. feel very much like an outsider. Every book that I complete or every poem, even every poem, I'm starting anew. And I'm in community with the New York school poets. Yeah. I really sense that they're not telegraphing the moment of writing when they're making poetry. You know, uh, there's just so, so much um, changing that happens, you know, uh, when I read a work and I feel like there's so much uncertainty going into a New York school poem and coming out of it each mm. time I read it. Uh, mm. For someone even as formal as Ted Berrigan, there's so much new things every time yeah. I read their work. I was just rereading the issue of Mother with Tambourine Life. And oh my gosh, I didn't even see that. Um, yeah. It's yeah. how he sequences it. So, yeah. you know, that's my, that's my takeaway from the New York school is as an outsider, I feel like they're a group of outsiders. Yeah. And yeah. Um, creating a space for them to learn from each other. Mm. Um, and make something new and yeah. uh, not caring if it's just them seeing it. Certainly Frank O'Hare didn't care, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I ran a press for 10 years called Second Avenue Press, which is named after 
Second Avenue. Second uh, Avenue. Really, that's, I think that embodies, I think for me, my deep, deep indebtedness to these poets is, um, and folks who come out of that tradition, because I really sense that, mm. you know, that outsiderness and that beginner's mind is privileged and what you call dilettanteness, amateur, mm. right? Yeah. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. like yeah. I wear my, I wear my amateur, amateur <laughs> hour on my sleeve and yeah. OBB. Yeah. You know, yeah. It, it, <laughs> You know, I work with Xerox for crying out loud. I didn't yeah. go to, I didn't go to, I got my MFA, but I, you know, didn't go to painter school. Mm. You know, I don't, so. Yeah, yeah. 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 And your, uh, your new book is a, it's obviously a, a true account of talking to the Southern and sunny side. I mean, there's a lot of Frank yeah. O'Hara going That's on. That's very Frank O'Hara, right? Yeah, tell us a little bit about, about that. Yeah, it's, um, it's a, I guess, a gathering of, what I call paraliterary works or mm -hmm. works that um, are not quite poems and um, but are poems. And so they're works that um, that are assemblages, they're works that are live film narrations, they're librettos, they're also commissioned works in response to very unpoetry worthy subjects like a new public park <laughs> or you know, sound poems that are transcribed and their walks across the neighborhood. Yeah. You know, so, you know, um, and that's, that's, that's it. I mean, that's probably as flaneur as you can get, right? Yeah. It's flaneur in form. And uh, I'm very grateful that Roof, James Sherry and Roof uh, decided and wanted me to take, you know, publish this literally a year out from OBB, because in many ways, it's a simpatico with OBB in terms yeah. of process but it's not as um it's got images but it's yeah you know okay prose prose and okay. poems okay so, yeah so yeah so one to read alongside yeah. or after on, on Sarah before during or after during they or after. totally they totally work together and yeah. this is with Ruth um with Ruth books yeah. yeah yeah and, and thank you Ruth thank you James Deborah and Lonely Christopher because it's a real honor to be publishing with such an amazing mm. press so and the um I just had a question about Queens yeah um just because Queens seems you know it's, it's obviously it's it's really important in your work and I'm interested in yeah. the idea of kind of bringing Queens into um New York writing <laughs> a little bit more yeah. I mean, it's often something yeah. certainly when I teach um my students New York equals Manhattan and, yeah. and there's sometimes a little bit of room for Brooklyn in there. Um, <laughs> right. If we look at someone like Maggie Nelson or Wh Whitman, I guess. Um, but Queens, like, what, what do you, what do you, how do you feel Queens kind of fits? Um, does it, does it kind of align with your sense of that outsider um, position that's kind of given a space? Um, yeah. Maybe in at least the idea of some of the New York schools work. Uh I mean, Joe Travolo has roots in yeah. Queens. Frank Lima, for me, immediately, he, his last place of residence was in um, Jamaica or Flushing, um, Queens. And, but for me, paramount to my I, identity as a Queens poet is the fact that it's the borough that produced Joseph Cornell. Yes, yes, yes. You know, and he made all of his important works, his boxes, yeah. shot his films, I mean, edited his films, you know, in that garage or basement right while he took care of his brother yeah and he lived with his mom um yeah. one of the greatest artists for me like I, I that's me i mean probably the most top three great american artists period but also yeah. international artists and he moves through so many disciplines um and his belief in synchronicity and chance and correspondence mm -hmm. um but robble maplethorpe comes from queens too yeah. right uh Jack Kerouac wrote on the road in Ozone Park. Uh, but I would say where I come from is I feel like um, a New York school poet rooted in Queens because of that history, that it's outside of history yeah. or of a chronology. Um, it's a, a, a borough that you want to also leave because there are parts of Queens that are really conservative. But I'm in Jackson Heights, and it's the most diverse space in all of North America. And I'm also an immigrant. Yeah. And um, I feel like, for me, that's maybe the 
new path or that's the path mm -hmm. I'm coming from towards mm -hmm. the New York school is, you know, having that station. Uh, and, you know, a lot of artists come out of here. Martin Scorsese comes out of here, you know, so filmmakers, but Malcolm X lived here. Yeah. Louis Armstrong, Toni Morrison drafted her first novels, I think, yeah. in Elmhurst. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I guess to be more obvious, I mean, writers of color, right? Artists of color, yeah. musicians of color, um, outsiders like Mapplethorpe. I mean, this mm. is a space that, you know, really shape, shapes our identities in a way that New York City proper might not, you know, make possible. So yeah, yeah. I lived in Brooklyn for a couple of years and I like Brooklyn. I'm not knocking Brooklyn. <laughs> Brooklyn's cool. I mean, Brooklyn is awesome. You know, yeah. Bernadette yeah. Mayer's from Brooklyn. You know, for that reason alone, you have to love, you know, Brooklyn. Yeah. Um, but I feel, um, I feel, I feel at home, most at home than I've ever felt in Queens. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's here where I make all my poems. Yeah. 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 So, and actually, I mean, you, it, when you start to think about it like that, it's, it's, it's suddenly apparent that Queens. It, it it matters enormously doesn't it and a little a little bit you know a little bit i suppose in the way that new york as a whole kind of has this adjacent relationship with the rest of the united states i don't know if you feel that queens kind of is in a similar position with the rest of new york you know sort of marginal because yeah. it wants to be yeah and, yeah and i would rather yeah, than it, being pushed there I mean, I think um, it's definitely unique from other other boroughs in New yeah. York because of how diverse its leadership has, you know, maintained it, mm -hmm. like creating a space for it. I mean, I'm in Jackson Heights where Danny Drum, former council person, you know, behind the best pride parade. Like mm. my family and I attended every year. We walked in it this year. We marched in it this year at my daughter's school. Um, but it's uh, from a perspective that's, I would say, far more diverse ethnically, uh, certainly even in terms of gender identity. Like we yeah. have a very strong presence of trans, uh, trans uh, women of color here in Queens, Latinx. Um, I think for me as an AAPI person, I mean, I feel safe here. I I, mm. I actually can just, I blend in and I like that. And I it's not an unusual thing to move through 50 different languages in a block, yeah. <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah. yeah. And I feel, I feel like Ted Berrigan's The Sonnets is informed by that. You know, a yeah. lot of the New York school, O'Hara, the diversity he encountered was, mm. made his poetry possible. So. Mm. To that extent, I'm continuing. I think. Yeah, yeah, that, that different that language, poetry. I think. Yeah, that but I think immediately it's safe for me because there's a, a Filipino community here in Queens, and mm -hmm. there's my community. My aunt, who moved here with her then partner, her girlfriend. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a very prominent queer Filipinx community here, mm. uh, which always bodes well in terms of safety for yeah. all. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, I, it, it's where I feel like I can just generate work. I feel like, you know, Superman, like I need my fortress of solitude. I yeah. don't like silence. I like the noise. Yeah. I've tried writing in so many different places. It's really here where I feel like um, I can be my best yeah. create, creatively. Yeah. You know? yeah. It works for me. It may not work for others. I'm not yeah. pushing. I'm not representing <laughs> Queen's tourism. <laughs> by any means you know a lot of people don't like the noise especially during the pandemic they don't like the proximity mm. i just want to say one more thing this is also ground zero for the pandemic yeah and um you will not find a more resilient space than being here in mm. ground zero right mm. elmhurst hospital famously known to be one of the yeah. worst hospitals what they had to endure the people here in queens had to do immigrant community yeah living 10 in a one bedroom apartment, you know? Yeah. It reminds me every day, yeah. right? Of just the spirit of the New Yorker. Yeah. Is here in, 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 in Jackson. Not as sexy as Brooklyn, not as sexy <laughs> as Manhattan or even the Bronx, right? Birthplace, yeah. of, hip, birthplace of hip hop, but you know, all these things. But the spirit keep me, of the keep, New Yorker. Keep, 
yeah keep me yeah. here yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 the resilience and experimentation yeah um, and 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 more i mean yeah i think the language the language is for, for me primarily right like yeah. that that's so immediate to me as a poet and just the parataxis that's your daily life right yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. There's no center. There's no center for literature here in Queens. And I love that. Yeah. Yeah. I absolutely love that. Um, when I did my swan song for my poet laureateship at Queens Museum, I called it Eternity after Joseph Cornell. And the idea was yeah. to use every single space in the museum all at once, no main stage and filled with experimental poetry and presses, because I feel like Joseph Cornell would have wanted that, mm. you know, mm we all have a space here and a stake here so yeah yeah so just fill it and keep moving fill it and keep moving yeah fill it and keep moving i love I, and it makes me feel sad that uh, when you see a cornell box in a museum yeah. that you can't pick it up yeah because um, there's so often these moving parts you know there's sand and there's those um kind of marbles that roll around and the boxes just seem to want to be heard and felt. you know you, you know what yeah. to that i had the great privilege of attending um a book launch of Bob Holman's at Agnes yeah. Gunn's apartment, you know, the great benefactor, Agnes Gunn, patron of the arts. And she had, she owns a Cornell and she was sitting on her oh. chair and I was hovering over Cornell and she's like, Oh, you can touch it. <laughs> Go ahead, touch it. Good. And I wouldn't, I just couldn't, <laughs> but, but that's what Cornell I think mm. would have wanted. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. You know, big shout out to Aggie Gunn, yeah, you know, like, yeah, you get, you get, you get JC. Yeah, you know? <laughs> yeah. He, used to, he talks about wanting to climb into the boxes as well, which I just think is amazing. It is, it is amazing. Small and sort of, yeah, he's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Um, just before we finish, I wondered yeah. if you've been reading or watching or if you've been to anything recently or, or heard anything that you would kind of recommend or put out there for other New York school writers or you know enthusiasts or scholars is there anything that you've kind of come across culturally recently that strikes you as being worth sharing yeah oh um hmm I would say in terms of books, uh, Lisa Robertson's Boat, her yeah. book Boat is amazing. Oh my gosh. I mean, she's not New York school, but just the process, the praxis behind it, right, is yeah. in is adjacent to the New York school. Um, yeah. It's amazing. It's such a generative work. Like I read it. I mean, Lisa Robertson, anything she writes, I'm I'm excited by and I'm inspired by, but this book in particular is a real how-to. Um for someone like myself who journals a lot. Um, okay. I would say in terms of shows, um, there's this new space called Cara, and they recently had a Marilyn Nance uh, weekend opening uh, with a Neo Mayunga sculpture, amazing surrealist sculpture, uh, Android inspired in their space, mm -hmm. but it's an incredible, incredible art space. Uh, and I'm just so grateful to be alive and to see a space like that with a truly internationalist vision. Uh, it was a Pan-African um, event celebrating Marilyn Nance's historic uh, gathering in the 70s. Uh, I forget what it's called, um, Federation, but it was a Pan-African event, but she's been removed from that history. The event okay. is foregrounded. So here's Kara making sure that Marilyn Nance is celebrated as she should be. And yeah. um, it's an amazing space in the meatpacking district that knows its history. And it's just like a really cool bookstore. Um, and the program director is an artist, Emika Tedral, who is uh, incredible too. And she has a group show in um, at Queens College. That's worth checking out mm -hmm. too. I forget mm. the name of the art show, but it's definitely worth checking out too. It's curated by Herb Tam. And it's one of the truly exciting group shows in response to the pandemic, um, okay. but opens so many portals for yeah. thinking about art making. And then yeah. of course, there's the fact of how does it resist, challenge anti-Asian hate 
yeah. it's in the wake of that or mm -hmm. ongoing. Okay. So that's something that I would, um, those are some shows that I would immediately yeah. recommend. And yeah. I went to a Do Ho Su, is that the artist's name, at um, Lehman Maupin, which is great. And so check that out too. Mm. Um, but that's like the Chelsea gallery scene, you know. Uh, I thought I'd give a shout out to the outer yeah. borough events in this new space, Cara, that's just definitely worth celebrating. Would you just um, tell us how you spell Cara? Is it just C-A-R-A? Yeah, C-A-R-A and then N-Y-C dot org, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, just look it up. And uh, uh, Jane Haidt, Haidt, H A I T, is the founder. And um, it's just, it's marvelous what, in the surrealist sense, but also marvelous in the true sense, what they've created for, you know, I think um, uh, uh, Manuela, who is the curator, mm -hmm. the way she described the mission statement, it's a place for contamination for uh love also that. but also for transmission i love that right conversation yeah. contamination conversation and transmission yeah right no 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 you know no coincidence that an important art group like the autoliths from the uk were invited to participate mm. um but marilyn nance opening the season is just a wonder so really definitely exactly. check out cara yeah yeah and the great and the great work that they're doing there yeah, yeah, it does. It sounds brilliant. And we um, we were talking a little bit before, but we hope to hopefully collaborate with them at some point in the future as well, if we can get some of our network over. Yeah. And I, I believe um, Ted Bergen's going to have a book launch soon at St. Mark's yeah. Yeah. For, yeah. for his prose called Get the Money. Yeah. Right? Yeah. How awesome yeah. a title is that? I know. It's such a good So a I, I, I'm going to make my way over to um, the church, the yeah. hallowed space of the church yeah. for, for that event and honor, honor Ted. Yeah. yeah. And I think um, we, we had a, um, a chat a few weeks ago online with um, Anselm and Eddie and, and yeah. Alice and also oh. Nick. So the four editors yeah. of this. Um, and Anne, I think Anne Waldman will be at the, um, the launch the in-person launch oh fantastic funny talking about that so um because there's a great little there's a bit in it um which is a sort of character character video yeah. um yeah of Anne yeah. just a yeah, yeah, yeah. description of, of what she's like and it's it's fantastic. right yeah, yeah really she's one of the she's she's one of the rabbit holes I ended up going down reading the sonnets <laughs> of course right yeah Anne and, yeah and yeah. good and Dick Gallup and all these names but Anne she's more she's amazing she's what amazing a, what a force of nature yeah Anne. yeah and such a body of work. Um, yeah, she's amazing. Yeah, she's so, so there's plenty of stuff out there, in other words. And I just go back to this, like get hold of this wonderful piece. Thank you. Um, it's honestly really just one of the most special reads I've oh, had thank you. for a long time. Yeah, really just completely surprising and delightful. Oh, um, can I make one more plug? Yeah. One more plug. Cool. Uh, Nightboat has a series at Artist Space through Segway now. They're curating it. But this young poet, she's Taiwanese. Her name is Cha Lun Chang. She has a book out called Prescribe that's coming out. And I, in my blurb, I liken it to the Tennis Court Oath, but Ooh. also Kamau Brathwaite's work. Oh, um, wow. Uh, and it is truly a revelatory work. This poet just humbles me, her poetry, okay. and I cannot, I cannot, cannot sing the praises enough of this okay. young poet, Chalun Chang, and uh, okay. it just gives me so much hope for, for poetry. So That's check really it out. I think exciting. it's coming. I think it's coming out in November. Okay. Night Boat's putting it out. Yeah, Night yeah. Boat. So, okay. Yeah. I'll, um, I'll make sure that that goes into my next yeah. round. Um, <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, really yeah. exciting. A, a, a 2022. Yeah. <laughs> dream <laughs> yeah 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 good. yeah, yeah. Good. okay well um i think we've been chatting for over an hour so maybe oh sorry <laughs> no 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 it's me <laughs> uh -uh. a waffler um so I'll, I'll i'll wrap it up but just just by saying thank you so very much for spending all this time talking through your work talking about the new york school and queens and the the things that we might do in New York and, and just, yeah, how we might kind of continue to um, 
contaminate ourselves with the New York school or transmit what we find um, in there in, yeah. in, in such a kind of capacious body of work. So thank you so much um, for spending so much time talking to Th us. Thank you for the conversation. And honestly, my gratitude to you and the New York School Studies and Yasmin for the, for the transmissions. Good, so. thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. Yeah, bye. Okay, let me...